Africa is home to many of the world's longest ruling heads of state. Some post-colonial leaders in the 1960s and 1970s sought to become president for life with Sevier managing to remain in power for three or more years. So by the turn of the 21st century, this trench of entrenched leadership had spread across the region, spurring corruption, instability, societal fractures, and economic stagnation. I mean, that's the story of Africa. The trend has been thwarted in some countries, and it's in part due to sustained pressure by civil society groups, regional blocs, but a global rise in authoritarianism threatens to undo recent progress. So currently, most African leaders are 55 years or older, and some as old as 75 or more, this represents a significant gap between policy makers and citizens. Uh, Africa is believed to have the most youthful population, and yet the youths of the African continent are usually not carried along in governance. The question is, how can the potentials of the youths be harnessed to make the continent successful? So joining us now on the show is uh, Nana Kwame Bediako, a visionary industrialist and founder of New Africa Foundation. Great to have you. Uh, Nana. Nana, let's talk about how young people in, in the continent can leapfrog you know, Africa into that path of development, which is what we need. We want to reinvent Africa because Mama Africa is blessed. Thank you very much. I think first of all, what we need to do is to get rid of the biggest disease in Africa, which is fear. The youth are growing up with fear. Okay, people are having education and spending 21 years of their life only to realize after that there are no jobs, there are no vacancies. And this fear is eradicating their hope. I think hope is a very strong thing that Africans need. The youth are not underlined or probably being undermined with their own capacity based on the ability that they have. Now, Africans don't have any sort of platforms like industrialization. Our economy is based on foreign influence. And that is rubbing the future of our children. Now that we have the biggest population, the youthful population in Africa, this is a source of labor force. And Africans need to take advantage of this moment. I could see the future. It's a vision that I could see ahead of me, that Africa can be changed. If we build these platforms and make sure these platforms take away the fear of our own youth so they can grow up to see. But, but, but how do we do it? If I were to teleport you in time, mm -hmm. I am sure that Osaji of Kwame Nkrumah was just saying this in 63 when OAU started. But since then till now, nothing has been done. Concrete, concrete steps. Can, how can we do this? Well, Osajifu was saying this in his youthful days. That's what we keep forgetting, okay? The mind works better, smarter, and more active between your 20s and your 45. By the time you're 50, you're heading towards your, your accruements, you know, what you have done in life. And that's what the machine is. You want to talk about your past, your future. It's no more talked about. Your past is what you talk about. Now, all of a sudden, African leaders have become 70 years old and 80 years old. Okay, I don't have a problem with old people. I think they're very wise to advise. But I don't expect people who have lived out to leave their future to build our future. Africans need to give the youth the chance to build the future. The likes of Bill Gates, the likes of um, uh, Zuckerberg, all of these people started their projects in their 30s and in their 40s, and we need to force to push our people there. You know, we need African products to be in the Western world, just like how our music is taking over the world now. That's how our leaders should act. That's how we should let the youth go through. I think that we're being restricted, and I like the fact that you asked this question about the youth, because this is giving me a, the right platform to speak for the youth. Africans are re restricting the youth to go past their potential. We need to give our youth that chance and we need to build the platforms to support them. All right, thank you very much. And I see the passion. You're a visionary industrialist. Two questions I have for you. The first question is talking about the youth. In your, from your perspective, do you think Africa should give the youth the platform and the choice or the youth should take it? So, it, which, which, would you, which would you stand for, which would you advocate? Because, you know, it's been said, give us a chance, give us a chance. At what point do the youth take the chance rather than waiting for it to be handed to them? And then the second question would be that you talk about, you know, um, being able to create wealth. You know, young people creating wealth. You created wealth at a, at such, at a very young age. You're in your 40s and you are a property mogul, not just in Ghana, but in other parts of the world. So share with us, against all odds, the, um, you know, being able to be successful as an entrepreneur 
it under this climate against all odds and the power that has given you with your voice? Sure, thank you very much. I mean, first of all, to answer your first one, power is taken, it's not given. But honor is rewarded, that's given. So somehow we need to take some things and we need to be given some things. I mean that the, the older generation of Africa can open the doors in certain areas by giving us the chance, okay? And the younger generation, we have the strength and we need to take power. You know, we need to make sure that we earn what we aim for. And I think that's the hope that I'm trying to sell to the youth of Africa. Now talking about building wealth, it is not about thinking about riches. Building wealth, it's thinking of how to build nations, how to build your home, how to build places around you. When you look, you look at the way we were raised by our fathers, our mothers, and the people that you know, uh, we grew up with in the home, there are rules, regulations, who is responsible for the food, paying the fees, this and that and that. But yet, when we come out of these spaces, we're not able to do so because some of us are coming out of our parents' homes at the age of 30 years old. Some of us are getting our first jobs at, in, at the age of 25. That is too late. I want people to understand that building wealth is based on respecting time. And time is the only source that we have between life and death. So if your time beats you, and you're not able to do certain things, build wealth at a certain age and start pushing to, to understand how to maintain and manage and then invest and develop. And then you're being robbed of your own opportunities in life. Your voice. You building wealth. That was the second part of the, uh, the other part of the question. Um, you building wealth, the importance of that and how has that ampl amplified your voice on the continent? I think I had to choose a different way to do that. And um, <laughs> it's kind of provoking, you know, when you're in Africa and you build wealth, you don't expect to be praised. You rather expect to be hated. People ask you questions. You know, they ask you questions when you started your journey. When you arrive at your destiny, everyone has questions for you. Mm. So I use the provocative way to influence the youth and enforce that power of them getting their own. You know, I, I thought that that was the only way I could speak to them. You know, somehow, some way, they accepted it. Some people were curious. Some people wanted to know more, like, how did you get here? How did you do this? How did you do and, and it was the best way for me to speak to them rather than preaching to them how to invest and how to develop. Today, my voice on the continent is not to say I'm successful or I'm wealthy. My voice on the continent is to say that, can we change our basic political principles that would give us equality, that would give us equity and empowerment? You know, I, I, I don't believe that I have to be a president to be saying this. I believe that I'm a citizen uh, and I come from the soil of Africa and I have the right to say some of these things to encourage the youth who are coming to move towards those lines. Okay, quick comment on what you were saying about youth and the older generation. I think what Africa probably needs is a mix. The energy of the youth, the resourcefulness of young people, and the wisdom of old people. Because we have seen many young people also in leadership positions who messed up. So it's not a function of age. It's about character. It's about discipline. It's about training, preparedness. I wanted to ask you, and this is a question, about what you think of all these sea tight African leaders and the wave of coups that we have witnessed threatening democracy in Africa? Well, as you can see, this wave of coups all of a sudden is coming from one side of Africa. When you define Africa, you will see that almost every English-speaking country is somehow sandwiched by French colonies. Mm -hmm. Okay, and all of a sudden, all the French colonies are having coup d'etats and this and that. And the people are just standing up and saying that we want to be governed this way. What I see as this is a revolution. It can be a re redemptive revolution. It can be a reformative revolution. Well, what I'm seeing also is that there is no violence in what has happened. Uh, we don't want to encourage people uh, that are against democracy. And neither are we saying that, you know, having coup d'etats are good things. We just think that the time has come that we take into our own hands how to govern our own people and not depend on uh, foreign policies to determine our political principles or policies that will govern an entire nation. If I could contribute to the current situation of Africa, I would say that the time has come that we should see that our resources, which is human resource and the mineral resources, are 
are things that we need to control ourselves. We need to build our own industrial platforms to be able to refine these goods, to be able to um, manufacture these goods, and then create distribution channels to supply ourselves so our economy will circulate amongst ourselves. We cannot be going out with our economy by going to other manufacturers and buying goods and importing them into our country and expect to have the right economy. You know, that's a structure of economy. Now, to change that, this is the exact way to use, to, to maintain, to sustain that by building these platforms. That would actually manufacture or refine our own internal resources. This will give jobs to the youth. This would give the chances to the older men that you're saying to have control, to make sure that whatever that Africans have been given is explored in the right way. And they say tight leaders who keep changing the constitution and the go goalposts, Kagame, uh, Paul Bia, uh, and all the other leaders, uh, in the Kutoria Guinea, Uganda, Yoweri, Museveni, and even in Eritrea, you know. So what do you think? Do you think that they, are, they pose a threat to the democratic uh, project? Well, first of all, I don't look at the leaders as much as I look at the nation, okay? The nation makes the government. The government doesn't make the people. So if some of these leaders have built the right economy for their country, for the citizens to be sustainable, then I don't see why we should complain about their governance. And if democracy is suitable for their country and the people are living well, there are no wars, they're peaceful and they're surviving, then why are we complaining? Because I feel like most foreign um, policies are actually commanding and instructing us as how we have to govern our countries. Maybe we should look more into our local policies. I don't have problem with these leaders. I think that we should make sure that- Even when they choose to just remain in office for life? No, I, don't, I didn't say that. And I'm not here to tell somebody to remain in office for life or to stay in office for four years. Either of them might not be good for me. I mean, when it comes to my opinion, because I don't also think that people can use four years to build a country when they spend two years of that by campaigning and two years of that trying to build a country. So it's Africans that we need to be decisive. Okay, let's stop making choices and let's be decisive. Decision is the best thing in this world. It will come with the choices later. But at the moment, we're, so, we're, we're, we're depending on so many ties, international ties, international this. Yes, we can have international commercial relationships. Okay, not foreign policies and influences that comes and deregulate our country. We should have relationships and it should be commercial. It should be industrial. It's powerful that way. Americans are doing that. Asians okay. are doing that. Everybody okay. who is successful in this world is doing so. So what would you rather for Africa? An active, benevolent dictator, if there's anything like that, or it's just a jargon from my mouth, or democracy that respects the rule of law? I think Africans should combine the two. Combine democracy. Benevolent dictators no, no, no. and democracy? No, they should combine the two as democracy, and whatever um, dictatorship, you no, know, whatever monarchy system that has been governing us traditionally. Okay, so we looking at most successful countries in this world. I'll pick one, England. Okay, they have a prime minister and they have a king. Okay, you're looking at Japan, it's the same. You're looking at uh, Dubai or one of these Emiratis. They all have sheikhs, and, and I call these benevolent dictators. They could be like chiefs, they could be whatever. But Africa has completely neglected our culture, our tradition, and we've become westernized, democratized, and over-politicized. So you think democracy is not an African thing? I am not saying so. I am saying that we need to combine it with the right element for us to have the right effect and the right support for humanity. That's what we need to do. We just can't stay here based on the foreign uh, policies and say that we're fully democratized. So how do and we govern ourselves if, we, if one man is the lord of the manor? Take, for instance, if it has to be one king that'll have to rule over a lot of people and you also have another government on the side of it like you iterated with the uh, emiratis and, and the likes so how do we effectively govern ourselves owing to the fact that those structures have changed over the years take for instance your in your country it's no longer about the uh asante Hane 
and the likes. It's not about the Ashanti king any longer. You have a government that is voted in after many years. So the structures have been changed over the years. So how, how do you govern? The structures that have been changed are the same structures that we need to rectify and correct. Life is about growing only when you see your mistakes and you correct them. Okay, the past was better than the present. And we don't know how worse the future can be. But if we start to change the structures now that becomes much more suitable for humanity in this sector of the world, we're already sitting on resources. And of course, we can feed 60% of this world with our resources. It's just that we're not in control of our resources. It means we have lost the direction of plot along the way. Maybe if we go back to history and then look back in the 11th century, the 10th century and the 9th century, Africans were doing great stuff. And a lot of it was based on monarchism. Okay, a lot of these things has already happened. It's not like we haven't had a history. So Africa should go back to monarchy? Well, we still have it, but we should combine so it. That in most African countries, the monarchy system is largely ceremonial, as we have it in England. England, in the United Kingdom, the monarchy doesn't have a say in government. It's just ceremonial. Yeah, it's so, a constitutional monarchy, though. <laughs> but, but they don't have, um, it's a parliament. They don't have, it's, it's, it's largely ceremonial in terms of um, governance, when it comes to governance. But I ca we can't have you here and not talk about the Ghanaian debt crisis and your... Um, take on this, especially coming from that country, is a problem of leadership because we've talked largely on leadership and how the youths ought to come in, in terms of being active players in governance and leadership in, 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 in Africa, on the African continent. What lessons can the continent learn from the unfortunate you know, um, incident in Ghana? And how, where do you go from here in terms of restoring the economy of Ghana? So I wouldn't say just Ghana. The entire West African economy is in shambles. Okay, Nigeria is facing the same problem. Ghana and other countries in West Africa. Why? I think West Africa holds the most attributed resources and proven resources. We are the pinnacle space of Africa. <laughs> we have the most. When you look all the way till you get to Centra, which is uh, DRC, Okay, we have the most. And I can see that there are Western and global influence that is kind of pursuing us, pushing us, you know, by how our country should be governed. And the IMF? I, 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 I wouldn't say IMF, but IMF cannot save Africa. Neither ECOWAS is not also doing the same. I mean, they stand for economy, but we have economy issues. So West Africa is really under attack. Okay, I'm not just looking at my country as Ghana being under the attack because I'm reading the scale of economy and the statistics and it tells me that yes, this part of Africa is really under attack. We, we don't seem to be um, um, performing every other four years. We don't seem to pass the curriculum that makes you have best economy in your country. So how can we improve it? What lessons can we learn and how can we improve it? Very quickly, we have just a minute to go, yeah. but just to have an opportunity to have conversations around what are some of the lessons that the rest of the continent, especially the Western part of Africa can learn? I think that, you know, it's very simple. The government should not become the private sector. The government should let the private sector be. Okay, so the government can concentrate on building the nation and let the private sector be the businessman that can introduce industrialization to create an economic balance and economic prosperity. This is very, very important because right now most African uh, entrepreneurs or African, uh, the private sector of West Africa have become contractors. Okay, just before you go, Nana Bediako, tell us about yourself. It's not every time we have someone flying in from London to sit with us in the Lagos uh, studio. Are you introduced as an industrialist? What do you do? And what's next? Are you planning to go into politics in your country, Ghana? Well, I mean, look, when you say politics in Africa, it's very different. There's politics in education, there's politics in churches, there's politics everywhere. We're politicized, okay? Um, I don't see myself as a politician because I don't have any experience in that industry. However, uh, being a leader can turn you into anything which I believe that there are times that, you know, we either have to make kings or kings have to make us. And if that time happens, God be so and God wanting so, I always go for the calling.
What do you do now? Uh, right now, I would just stick to the business. I would just stick to building the wealth and actually adding value to society like I'm always doing. And I really think that that's what my wealth has been based on. And I will stick to that. And anything that comes, just remember, I have the strength, I have the courage, I have the power to handle it. That's one good thing that I thank God for. Thank you very much, Nana Beriakov, for joining us on The Morning Show. Beautiful.